Everything started with me and a couple of my buddies hanging out at my place. For the sake of the story, I will name my two friends Michael and Lucas. Basically, everyone got pretty much wasted from drinking too much bourbon that Michael had brought with him. It was around 2 a.m. when Lucas, still a bit drunk, suggested we go and explore the abandoned insane asylum. For the context, we will all live together in around the same small town. This is not much going on there, but when you drive about 15 miles in empty back roads, you would come across the old mental hospital which had been vegetating ever since it was abandoned in the 1960s due to unknown reasons. Now back to the story, since there was really nothing better to do, we all agreed to the 30 minute drive. We grabbed our backpacks, some water, three flashlights and a big hunting knife for protection. Lucas also brought a couple of graffiti cans for obvious reasons. Yeah, he was into that stuff at the time. The drive was relatively unspectacular with the exception that Michael almost ran over a rattlesnake laying in the middle of the road. When we arrived, the sight of this huge asylum just standing there for all those years made me feel a little uneasy. But my doubts quickly evaporated as Michael and Lucas were already going around the place looking for an entrance. We finally found a window that was not completely boarded up with beams and then crawled head first through the small opening. I quickly got on my feet and let my eyes get adjusted to the darkness that completely surrounded us. We powered up our flashlights and began wandering through the corridors with rooms on other sides. The walls were pretty much all covered in graffiti. So Lucas suggested that we should look out for a basement entrance with the intention of finding a free spot for his graffiti. After a 30 minute search we finally found the basement entrance. The stairs were rusty and creaked with every step. The whole basement smelled horrible. Lucas quickly disappeared down a long hallway with rooms on either side and, and Michael and I were keeping pace up behind him. As we wandered off further into the dark hallway which our cheap flashlights only poorly lit up, the terrible smell grew worse. I can only describe it as a mixture of vomit and rotten eggs. What struck me as odd was that all the walls were pretty much clean, unlike the site that we had made at the first floor. It almost seemed like nobody had ever made it all the way to explore the basement level. Everything was going relatively smoothly up until the point when Lucas started making so much noise by shaking his graffiti cans in order to prepare them for his act of vandalism. So, he started spray painting one of the nearby walls. Michael and I just watched him do his thing. When he finally finished his piece, the smell of aerosol in the air almost drowned out the horrible stink that was still in the air. As we made our way down the hallway, I could tell that the smell came from a small room further down to the left of us. At this point, we were all pretty much freaking out, unsure of what we would find in that room. I had the hunting knife tight in my hands as I approached the room and shined my flashlight inside. The light beam hit, and I kid you not, a circle of burnt-out candles appeared. In the center of the candles was a dark object hanging from the ceiling. At this point, I had to vomit because of the smell coming from this room. Michael was the bravest one of us as he stumbled into this room grabbing a metal bar from the pile of junk next to him, poking the object with it. As right then we realized the huge amount of dark brownish stains on the floor under that thing. We all quickly sobered up due to the situation as we heard several voices and fast approaching footsteps from across the other hallway. I never ran that fast in my entire life. It's really amazing what adrenaline can affect. We finally reached the set of stairs and sprinted through the floor. As we finally reached the window that we had entered from, Michael also vomited onto the floor. Lucas then realized that he had left his backpack full of his stuff in the basement, as he had not enough time to pick it up or realize that he left it. We sprinted out front and got into my car and just hightailed it out of there. As much as I know we only have suggestions of what we saw in that basement, maybe there was some kind of ritual taking place there, or we just stumbled across some sort of murder scene. We haven't told anyone this story. In fact, Lucas told me that he had not had a good night of sleep since that day, knowing he left his wallet in the backpack there and keeping all his personal information, including his 
home address stuck in that asylum. This story still gives me chills and I haven't spoken of it in a while. This is a long story and needs extensive backstory so please bear with me. So flashback to high school. I wasn't the most social guy in school. I had my really close friends but other than that I would classify myself as a loner. I had really bad acne which affected me a lot when meeting new people and I was very addicted to World of Warcraft. So it was Friday night. Classic raid night in Vanilla WoW. About two hours before the raid, my best friend that I grew up with, let's call him T, he called me. He's like, Yo bro, I'm meeting up with two women later tonight. Let's drink and hang out with these chicks. It was one of those classic fork in the road moments. Be a nerd and blow another Friday night playing a video game, or go out with my best friend and see if I can actually finally lose my virginity. Before I get to the next part of the story, I need to give some backstory on T. T was nothing short of a boss, and I truly looked up to him. He was a really good looking guy and extremely intelligent. I'm not understating this. He's the type of guy when he walks into a room, all the women just gravitate to him. But T has a dark side. Even though he has everything going for him, it was never good enough. He got expelled from school we both went to for having a couple of grams and aka just trying to flex and got caught by the teacher. So he was sent to another school about 30 minutes away from me. Nothing changed and it actually got far far worse. He became the guy. He started messing around with all the chicks and became a massive dealer. He supplied about four to five high schools and colleges in the area and was for sure on the radar of the law and other rivals. And now to the backstory. So after playing mental ping pong for about 30 minutes weighing all the options, potentially getting laid or drunk or nerded up like usual, I finally said forget it. Count me in for tonight, T. I bribe my brother 20 bucks and he agrees to raid me. And the night begins. T picks me up from my place and greets me with a big smile and says, We're getting late tonight, brother. I'm like, whatever bro, we'll see. I'm very used to T over-exaggerating. So I quickly ask, when are we meeting up with these women? It's about 9.30pm at night. Under his voice he says around 1am. I'm like, WTF, are we supposed to be due for three and a half hours? T pulls out a bottle of Bacardi 151 with a metal grate and passes it to me. Thankfully, I've been drinking hard that year, so my tolerance was decent. We head to this awesome park to burn time and start passing the bottle back and forth. We catch up on life, and we're about 6 out of 10 drunk at this point. It's around 11.30ish. So within an hour and a half still to burn before we're supposed to meet up with said women, T says... Let's roll the Taco Bell. We can get some food and sober up. At this point, I'm drunk and we have some time to burn, so whatever. Let's head to Taco Bell. As most degenerates know, Taco Bell was open late and the one we went to is located in a shopping center. No surprise at around 12 a.m. there are no cars whatsoever in the parking lot except for the workers of Taco Bell. T rolls up to buy his food and we just park outside Taco Bell while he eats. While T is eating, I snag a cigarette and get some fresh air. As I puff half on a Marlboro light, a white van rolls up with tinted windows and no license plate. The van parks to the west of our car about 50 feet in the empty parking lot. The lights inside and outside the van instantly turn off and no one gets out. I kept smoking, but I don't think much of it. I mean, we're essentially doing the same thing, but a car with no license plate was obviously weird. I get back into T's car, and I start getting a really uneasy feeling about this van. At this point, I'm all sobered off a little, and I just keep eyeing down this van. Something doesn't feel right. 
It goes to park three-fourths of the way into the parking lot with a perfect view of the car. I turn to T and tell him it's time to leave. This is where the backstory comes into play. As I mentioned, T is very deep at this point and was at the height of his dealing career. So the exact thought was in the back of my mind when this van was parked inconspicuously. The next part is not exaggerated in the slightest. T turns on his headlights to his car to leave, and a kitty not. Almost instantly after our lights are on, the white van lights turn on. My stomach dropped to the floor. At this point, we're both freaking out. T knows he could be busted by the police at any point, and that's not even considering all his rivals and people he's screwed over. So right when we see the light up from the van, we turn ours off. No joke, the van turns their lights off to mimic our reaction. T reaches to the back seat of his car and pulls out a backpack with a weapon in it. I can't believe this is actually going down. At this point, I'm inching on crying. This is obviously no coincidence. We were followed to the shopping center. We sat paralyzed in fear and dripping in sweat for the next ten minutes, waiting to see if the van would move, and it didn't. T starts mumbling to himself. This might be a good squad that was hired to hunt me down. I'm speechless to that comment. I was a normal, unsocial kid who loved sports and video games, and now I'm in this terrible and possibly life-threatening situation. At this point, I really wish I just stayed home and played World of Warcraft. No potential for any girls is worth the heart attack I'm currently going through. I felt extremely nauseous and I'm so close to throwing up. Is this actually happening or am I dreaming? This doesn't feel like the police. They wouldn't go through this type of charade. They would have turned on the lights and arrested us by now, obviously. I can't stand this demented showdown we're currently in, and I'm on the verge of mental breakdown and tears are rolling down my face. I turn to T and tell him to turn his lights on one more time. And almost like clockwork, the van flicks on their lights, but this time was very different. I was able to see multiple shadows of hooded men in the van. I turn to T and tell him to book it out of there. I've never seen someone go 0-60 to 60 out of a shopping center before, but you can bet you're behind we did. T turns his head while exiting the shopping center and sees the van following us at a fast pace. We start cutting down side roads for the next five minutes. Thankfully, no one is following us. At this point, I'm just staring at T and asking what was going on, bro. T says with a weak voice that I have no idea other than what you know and I do, but aka some sort of dealing. We take a deep breath, we hit the bottle some more, and the next 20 minutes we sat in silence to come to grips with what was almost being involved in some sort of sting operation, robbed by rivals or even worse. Once our heart rate drops below 250 beats per minute, we finally head to meet the women. T and I never spoke at that moment again, and to the thought of that night, it still sends shivers down to my core. I'm a 29 year old female, however at the time of these events I was 22 to 24. I joined the United States Army to help people. I have always wanted to make a difference in the lives of others, so when I got stationed out in Colorado I was nervous but hopeful. Once I was settled into my new unit and had met my new co-workers, all seemed to fall in place. Everything was good. Until it wasn't. It started out small, like most things do. Sergeant C would snatch papers right out of my hands and then accuse me of not knowing what I was doing. He would ask me to do things for him immediately, although I was already doing something for someone who was of a higher rank than him, and when I would tell him so, he would say, I don't care. Do what I told you to. Eventually, it progressed to something more like stalking. 
Sergeant C would come into work and ask me about my personal plans and appointments for the week. He would then have me ask him if I could keep those appointments or I had to cancel them. Then, when I was able to keep the appointment, I had to write the time down on a marker board for him to see. When I went to either an appointment or to get mail for my unit, which I did daily because I was the unit mail clerk, if I wasn't back when he thought I should be, he would call for me or have a lower enlisted soldier call me to tell me to hurry up and get back. And if I didn't answer right away, he would keep calling and texting me to call him back immediately. When I was at work, he would constantly hover over my shoulder, watching me work instead of doing his own work. He would also call me on the weekend and ask where I was, what I was doing, and who I was with. When I started dating my now husband, he came into work asking why I didn't ask his permission to date him. Again, I'm an adult woman. He would then require me to call him every night before I would go to sleep and ask him if he needed me to do anything for him, even on the weekends. If I forgot to call him, he would call me. When getting the mail, I needed a license to drive a particular vehicle, which I had to take a class for. I got all of the required documents for it, but Sergeant C refused to let me take the class. So, when I got the mail by driving the vehicle without the proper documentation, he called me up at 8 at night in a Walgreens parking lot to ask how I get the mail, even though he and many others knew how. He kept repeating, Hey, how do you get the mail? over and over, until I broke down and my husband had to take the phone and talk to him. It was so bad that I would cry every night and every morning. I eventually was told to go to counseling by my captain. When Sergeant C found out that he was the reason I was seeing a counselor, he cornered me in the back of the office where no one could see and he'd made me tell him that I was afraid of him and that I couldn't work with him. Once after already being in counseling for a while, my first sergeant told me that I would be going to NTC, or deployment training, with Sergeant C alone. I told him I wasn't sure that was such a good idea with everything that has happened and he eventually sent someone else with him. I had many people tell me they saw Sergeant C verbally and mentally abuse me, harass me, and no one did a freaking thing to stop it. I had many panic attacks and had to be admitted to the ER after a verbal altercation with him where he chased me around the office yelling. Eventually I left the army and now work as a civilian worker for an air force base. However, the scares still run deep as I'm still attending counseling. I take medication and have been diagnosed with extreme anxiety and PTSD. I suffer from panic attacks and nightmares about him one day finding me again. I hope that one day things like this are taken more seriously and that no one else has to deal with someone like him. I was a young mother. I had my son at 18 and was trying my best to present myself as put together an adult to combat the near constant scrutiny that my age seemed to attract. Before the birth of my son, his father and I were trying desperately to find a decent home to bring him into. We found a newly remodeled home in the country of Hayward, Wisconsin. This is a major tourist trap in the summer, but the location was beautiful and was drastically underpriced for the number of rooms it had, the new flooring and devices it now boasted and the original wood barn in the yard that added up to that up-north aesthetic. With time seeming to be of the essence, we jumped on the opportunity and contacted the landlord, and surprisingly even with how beautiful the home seemingly appeared, there had not been any interest. We set up a showing, and upon seeing it in person, we immediately decided to move forward with the rental, since it was the perfect amount of domestic and put-together that we were looking for in our minds to solidify that we had our stuff together. Once we began moving in and setting up for the baby, we also decided to prepare for a small housewarming party to show off our new mature residence. Feeling slightly overwhelmed amidst the pandemonium that comes with moving, we had some friends that grew up from around the area come to aid us and simplify the process as much as they could. However, Upon arrival, one of the men that came to assist us that was born and raised slightly down a few country roads 
became as pale as the Wisconsin snow that speckled the ground around us. As we greeted him and snapped him back to reality, he sputtered out an uncharacteristically nervous, Hey, what's up? Nice to see you guys. Well, let's get going, shall we? As we all continued monotonously unpacking and cleaning, I noticed an edge to him that was not usually present. I approached him to open up the floor to have a conversation about what was troubling him. His face slightly twitched and his frigid demeanor I had been witnessing shifted to agitation. He sat in silence for a few seconds until quietly uttering out, You seriously have no idea where this place is. I solemnly looked back at him and awkwardly chuckled before realizing he wasn't laughing. I responded with, uh, no, I mean, it's our new home, but... Before I could finish my sentence, he abruptly added, Two people were murdered here, Mary. They were shot and killed and drug out to the barn. One of them leaving the bathroom, the other laying in the master bedroom. The messed up thing is that the kid had a party just hours after it all. I was completely awe-stricken in the most macabre of ways, but managed to retort to Shaggy, Oh, I thought it was just an urban legend. I'm gonna finish with the other room real quick. He left shortly after, but the tense mood that surrounded him remained. As days went on and my then partner began working at a factory during the night, I began to feel more and more anxious and restless during the hours I spent alone. The barn stood as this foreboding, nagging reminder of what our paled, moving companion had warned me of. One day, to alleviate the anxiety that was churning around in my already hormonal brain, I decided to walk through the adjacent field and explore the outlying trees. As I began to approach the end of the clearing, I noticed what appeared to be a large garbage pile. As I neared it, I quickly recognized old laminate flooring, sinks, and furniture. As I gazed down on my puzzling discovery, I noticed other trinkets and personal household items. The more I stared, the more I realized something that sent an icy spear down my whole spine. The laminate flooring had what seemed to be a dried brownish-reddish paint spattered on it, and say what you will, but this combined with the morbid story and already present morning sickness was enough to make me physically ill. I ran back to the home and locked all of the doors and sat with all the curtains drawn, which was my natural state in the home when my partner was gone due to a constant uneasy feeling of being watched or not being as alone as I should have been. I went against my better judgment and decided to do some research when I stumbled across an article I'll attach below. To my absolute utter sickening dismay, this article coldly and factually solidified what our nervous friend had warned me of weeks before. After this gruesome discovery, we promptly contacted the landlord and chastised her for not informing us of what we had happened on our seemingly perfect new property. She apologized to us and let us terminate our lease early, and we moved out the quickest I've ever seen someone move out of a home. So, in closing, none of us were injured and there were no horribly disfigured ghosts looming in doorways in the corner of my vision, hissing for us to get out. There was just this heavy, dark feeling that seemed to weigh on me over time. I will never 100% know if the rubble I found across the field was significant to the horrific history of the home or just some redneck dumping site. However, I do know the ever uneasy feeling I constantly felt in that home. The burned and jarring image of the silhouette of the barn in the distance and the two innocent people that lost their lives in a place we were trying to make our own. My advice to anyone looking into a new home after this experience is to do your research, check the history of the home, and always be mindful that when something seems too good to be true, that may very well be the case. I work at a small town nursing home. The nursing home is off the main hospital in town and it's a pretty decent job and beats retail any day. 
For context, it has a special care area where flight risks and those who are in the worst throes of dementia and Alzheimer's stay in little apartments and receive more personal care. I usually work this area in the hall leading to it, which has its own set of apartments. I love all residents. They have their good days and bad days, but all in all, they are sweet, good people. I don't work directly with the residents, but... I clean their rooms every day, so I've gotten to know them and they remember me, for the most part. Now, the only downside is when the precious people pass on. Your heart breaks because you grow attached to them, and even form some sort of friendship with them. And here's my story. There's this sweet lady, and she is honestly one of my favorite residents, and for privacy's sake, let's call her Anne. Anne lives in this special care area. Anne has something sort of like dementia, not entirely sure, but she tends to hallucinate. She often sees things in people that aren't there. She also dances to music that isn't playing, which is kind of adorable. Anne has told me multiple times that she sees dead people. On the ceiling, out the windows, under the bed. Sometimes they have wings or halos even, and I tell her that they're angels and that she has nothing to worry about but she's still afraid of these things. She pointed behind me while I'd been cleaning and chatting with her and said, There, look. I turned and there's never anything there, which has given me the creeps more than once. One day a fellow resident in the special care area passed away. We were all sad to see them pass and there was a bit of a dark cloud in the special care area as I was cleaning Anne's room I saw that she was asleep and tried not to disturb her as she napped. She was in her bed and I accidentally bumped the frame with my broom. She woke up and I was startled and apologized, but she spoke before I could and said sadly, They're coming for the other one too. She started to cry. I was baffled but tried to comfort her. I thought maybe she was confused. Maybe she was remembering something or just saying something random as the residents there do sometimes. Unfortunately, a few days later, another resident passed away. I came into the special care area to clean their room after they passed. As I pushed my car past Anne's room, she's sitting in her chair by the window and muttering and crying to herself. They came for her too. I wondered, can Anne see the dead, the Grim Reaper of sorts, or something else entirely? In November 2016, I was spending the weekend at my dad's. I was bored and so was everyone else, so my stepbrother said, Hey, you guys want to go do parkour in the woods? To me and my friend, and we said sure. We went to his backyard, and in order to get on the path, we had to climb a tree that was growing slanted out of the ground, and since I was too short, my stepbrother climbed up first and then grabbed my hand, and then I pulled myself up. My friend had poor upper body strength and couldn't climb, so we had to take the long way. We had to take the long way, crawling through bushes, walking across pipes on rivers, having to grab thorn bushes to keep balance. We eventually got to the building my stepbrother wanted to climb. He said there was a ladder, so I thankfully wasn't worried. But this ladder he was talking about was an old oak tree with eight pieces of 3x5s nailed to the tree and my stepbrother climbed up in seconds. I climbed the tree to the top, which was the same height as the building, about three stories tall. I climbed to the top, but the building was about six feet apart from the tree, and me being short, I wasn't confident enough to make the jump, and my stepbrother said, It's fine. You got it. I made the jump, and slipped last second, and I was dangling my left hand, and he had to pull me up. It scared the life out of my friend when he saw it was almost three stories and just said, forget that. And it was time to get down, my stepbrother said, you won't fall. I have fallen, but it took me 30 minutes to get down and by the time we got home, 
I was covered in cuts with thorn bushes. If I fell, I would have probably hit my head on the bricks at the bottom and could have died. My brother said, I actually fell once, but there was a big bush with leaves, so I didn't actually get hurt. The bush wasn't there when we went, so if I fell, I would have seriously gotten hurt. This story takes place on July 20th, 2012, the day that the shooting in Aurora, Colorado happened. Me, my friend, and my brother had purchased tickets for the midnight showing of The Dark Knight Rises. At 11.30, we decided to go to McDonald's a few minutes away so we wouldn't have to spend a fortune on the food and drinks at the theater. After we finished our meal, we started our walk back to the theater. When we were about a third of the way there, I saw a guy in his mid-twenties who had followed us since we left McDonald's and started to pick up pace. It's important to point out that I was only 14 at the time, but my friend and brother were only 16, so we were not going to be able to fight a guy if he tried to rob us. I told my friend about the guy, and he told me not to be worried. I remembered that we were talking about whether or not Batman would die in the movie when all of a sudden we heard loud footsteps. We turned around to see the guy who was following us, pointing a gun at us. He told us he wanted our wallets and phones, and we immediately handed it to him based on what he demanded. My brother had kept the tickets in his wallets that the guy had just taken. The crazy part was that this guy looked me dead in the eyes and said, Even the worst things have something good about them. We all stood there confused until we walked off into an alley. We ran back to the theater and when we got back, they were sold out of tickets. We headed back home and found out in the morning what had happened. Just thinking that we could have been three of the twelve victims of the Aurora Dark Knight Rises theater shooting sent chills down my spine. As for what the guy said, I just don't know if he had a sick sense of humor or knew that we didn't. Even though we didn't get a great look at that guy, I can confirm that he did have a sick sense of humor and knew something that we didn't. Regardless of why he said what he said in my mind, he saved our lives, or at the very least, saved us from having the experience of that horrific event firsthand. If you have any questions, please do feel free to ask them if you read the whole thing. I thank you for being strong and a trooper through this whole thing. For context, I'm a 14-year-old female, and two days ago something very creepy unnerving happened to me. I'm on the cross-country team at my school, and our coach wants us to stay in shape during quarantine, so I was going on a run. I tend to run early in the morning, around 5.30 to 6 a.m., because the weather is cooler and less people are out and about. It's also nice to get your run over with so the rest of the day is free. For you to understand exactly what happened, I need to explain the route that I run. Bear with me. I live in a nicer neighborhood in the US. My neighborhood is also near a major road. When I go on my run, I leave my neighborhood, travel down the major road and enter a different neighborhood that is close to my own. This neighborhood has a low crime rate, is on the richer side, and goes along a big reservoir. It has lots of hills, pretty foliage, and some of the bigger houses near the entrance of the neighborhood are backed up against some woods. I run through it because I like to look at the big houses and sometimes some of the wildlife, such as deer, makes it way out of the woods. When I run through it early in the morning, I get to enjoy the lack of people and the bird song. You need to understand that I run this route every morning and no strange occurrences have happened with me being there. Now that you understand the setup, I'll tell you what happened. Like I said, this was two days ago. I left my house and neighborhood per usual and ran along the major road to the entrance of the neighborhood that I usually run in. Almost as soon as I come across the first house on the street, one of the ones that is backed up against the woods, I hear rustling in the bushes. I think, oh cool, it's probably one of the deer, and slow down and try and spot it, but 
It never came out of the bushes. So I pick up my pace and come along. Not long after that, maybe two minutes later, I hear someone on my bike behind me. This isn't unusual, so I don't think much about it, until the guy on the bike says, Beep, beep. I'm like, okay, maybe he doesn't have a bell or something, so I move over to the right to let the guy pass me on my left. But he doesn't. He stays right behind me. I'm not a slow runner, but someone on my bike would definitely be faster than me. If you have ever tried to go really slow on a bike, you'll understand how hard it is to keep your balance. So I'm thinking, okay, this is weird. I have a feeling that this guy is bad news and that I need to shake him. So I slow to a stop and get over to the side of the road to tie my shoe and to see if he'll pass me. But he doesn't. He just stops. It becomes clear that he isn't going anywhere. I get back on the sidewalk and keep running. Bad choice, I know, but I was panicking. Of course, the man on the bike follows. But even though my attempt to shake him didn't work, I got a good look at him. He was tall, thin, with glasses, and he wore a Nirvana t-shirt. He definitely looked like a serial killer. As an avid reader of horror novels and obsessive listener of scary podcasts, I was already thinking of the absolute worst possible outcome. I was going to be murdered when I had been out of my house for less than 10 minutes. Worse, I was over 10 miles from my house, so I was going to have to continue running. Now I know what I should have done was to go to the closest house and let the family that lived in it know what was going on, but I wasn't thinking clearly, so I kept running, and the man on the bike kept following me at a meticulously slow pace. I was tired, sweaty, and near tears. I wanted to go home. Home was the only thing on my mind. I started looking around for ways to lose him or hide. Just up ahead of me was a sharp turn. My hope was that I could get around the turn faster than him and then hide. Not a very well developed plan, but better than being killed by a rando. I sprinted around the corner as fast as I could, right into a young woman who was out walking her two dogs. Big dogs, German shepherds actually. I started to apologize profusely, trying to look calm. Apparently I didn't look calm at all because she asked me what was wrong. The man was still behind me, practically breathing down my neck. I stared at the woman, pleading with my eyes, and said, How's your walk going on, Mom? I prayed that she would understand, that she would play along, and fortunately for me, she did. She smiled at me and said, Where are you? Where were you? Me and your father were looking for you all over. We both then turned to look at the man on the bike, who looked extremely shocked. He turned around and quickly pedaled away, almost running into an oncoming car, actually. As soon as he was gone, I broke down crying, telling the woman everything. She was very sympathetic and kind, and she ended up calling my parents to come pick me up. I was still sobbing when they arrived, and I had to catch my breath before them telling me what happened. And looking back, I'm almost positive that if I hadn't run into that woman, that something awful would have happened. I'm not sure if the rustling in the bushes at the entrance of the neighborhood was the man on the bike or not, but I am completely content with never knowing. I have not been back to that neighborhood since, and I'm not sure if I ever will. When I was four years old, my family and I used to live in a house located in Querétaro, Mexico. I'm Mexican, so I'm sorry if my English is not the best. It was a pretty safe neighborhood where many houses and condos were being constructed. My dad worked in some coffee plantations outside the city most of the week, but he spent the weekends at home, so he was the only one besides my mom who had the keys to the outside gate and the front door. I remember it was Halloween because the afternoon of the day that I had made some carved pumpkins with my mom and after we went trick-or-treating and off to bed. We left them with some lit candles inside them in the dining room and living room area. We went to sleep and I remember that at some point at night my mom woke me up and told me not to make noise and that someone had entered the house but she didn't know who it was. 
I grabbed onto her back like a piggyback ride and she peeked up the stairs to see if that she saw someone downstairs. He started calling, Fernando, my dad's name, and we could hear a little noise downstairs like someone didn't want to make any noise, and as soon as my mom spoke, the noise stopped. Immediately my mom knew that it was not my father and ran to her room with me on her back. She called the cops and my dad, but by the time they got there, there was nobody downstairs. Just completely smashed pumpkins and the door wide open. This happened about two years ago and still scares me when I think about it. First, a little background. I live in the UK and I'm from a smallish area, nothing fancy. I'm 18 and at the time I was 16 and working at a family friend's pub collecting glasses. I worked from 7 to 11 at night and I lived about 3.5 hours to 45 minutes away. To get home, I had to walk through a park. Now, this park had three entrances and exits, two at the top and one at the bottom which led to the town and center and main shopping area. The top two led to two different areas. One is a skate park and the other is literally right next to a comprehensive school and a big field. This park had a lot of bushes and trees outside each entrance to the park which are very dim. Each entrance was a big gate and they were always open and this is important for later. I had to walk the path that led towards the school since it was furthest away from home. I worked at the pub for a year and had stuck to the same route going home. Not smart, I know. I'd leave at around 11, sometimes a few minutes before, sometimes a few minutes after. It took about 10 minutes to get to the park, so I'd be walking through the park at around half 11, sometimes or 15 minutes past. Now, the entrance I had to use to get into the park was the one at the bottom, the one that leads to the shopping area. It had one lamppost outside the gate and that was it. That was the only light so I could see about 10 foot into the park and there were a few benches. No one was ever in the park when I walked through it from work. During the autumn and winter weeks it was always empty, even the streets were, so you can imagine my shock when I see a man sitting on the bench as I walk through the park gates. Now this was so strange. It was around 45 minutes past 11, almost 12 at night. It's pitch black and freezing and this dude was just sitting on the bench. I couldn't see him too well at first, but as I got closer, I got a good look at him. He was about 20 to 25, long hair and a ponytail, but not scruffy, one tight and one neat. He had a hoop earring and his nose was pierced. I can't remember his eye color, he was so pale and his hair was jet black with red tips which went past his shoulders. He wore all black, he dressed like an emo to be honest. Looking past now, he kind of reminds me and looks like Dracula from the movie Van Helsing. He was on his phone and looked up at me as I walked towards him and he just stared at me as I walked past. I gave him a slight nod and kept walking. He just looked up at me and down, smirking, which kind of freaked me out. He didn't say anything and I managed to get home and didn't think much of him and forgot about it. The next night I went to work, finished my shift and walked through the park and again, he was there. On his phone wearing all black and a ponytail. He looked up and saw me and smiled. I smiled back but walked a bit faster past him again and said nothing. This happened the next night but on... The fourth night, he wasn't there. I walked through the park as usual, but I felt so, so uneasy. It was pitch black, no light except for the moon, and what do I hear? Footsteps. Quick footsteps behind me, so I turn around, and absolutely nothing. I wasn't taking any chances, so I ran through the park, and I swear over the sound of my heart beating fast, and my footsteps, I heard twigs snapping and leaving crunching. After that, I started getting a lift home for about two weeks from a friend. Then that friend went on holiday, so I had to start walking home through the park again. First night, which was Monday night, the man wasn't there, but I still felt uneasy, like I was being watched. 
Second night, he was there, sitting on the bench, smiling, looking at me, but this time he spoke. In the very deep voice, he said, Hey, baby. Love the tights and skirt. God. I was wearing a black skirt and sheer tights with thick black thigh-high socks and Doc Martens with a black biker jacket and thick scarf. I had to wear all black for work. I looked at him, awkwardly smiled, and hurried away. The next week, he was in the park but made certain comments but always sat on the bench. I'd try and get lifts home, but when I could, I'd still have to walk through the park most of the time, and Lord hated that walk. One night, things escalated. I walked through the park as usual, and again, he was there sitting, smiling at me, and I did my best to ignore him as he made comments about my body and what he wanted to do to me. As I was walking past him, I was out of the light and could see two to three feet in front of me. I must have been about twenty feet away from when I heard running behind me, and I turned around and... Bam! Someone runs into me full speed and knocks me to the floor. I feel a heavy weight on me and I instantly feel hair on my face and a hand over my mouth. A familiar deep voice tells me not to fight and that it'll be over quick if I don't fight. It's him. He's on top of me and his hands start to wander down to my tummy and he starts to lift my skirt. I hear his zipper and he's rambling about how he knows I want this and how he's been waiting to do this for so long. He took his hand off of my mouth and that's when I took the chance. I bit him hard, real hard, and he screamed. He sat up off of me and I could barely see but he was holding his hand and cursing at me so I took the opportunity and pushed him off of me and got up. I started to run and I heard him running after me. I ran towards the first gate, the one that I usually use to leave and was shocked and mortified to see it was locked somehow. I could see it had a lock on it because the lampposts on the other side shone onto the usually open gate. I was so confused but I could hear him shouting and I started to run again and I ran towards the other gate and it was closed but not of the way. There was a small gap so I squeezed through. This was the skate park gate. I managed to squeeze through as he tried to grab me and I turned and looked at him for a few seconds catching my breath. He stared at me and then started to try and fit through the gate, so I booked it as fast as I could. I ran towards the skate park path. The skate park was full of bushes, and one side of the path that ran through it, it also had a long, dark path, which also was about a 20-minute walk down it, and it led to a main road, but it's usually completely dead. I ran through the skate park and hid in the bushes, waiting for him, since it had ran onto the long path. I'd been visible, and he'd be able to see me and chase me since no one was around, and I would stand no chance. The path that led to the roads had very few lights, but still had enough, and he would see me and be able to find me. He sat in the bushes, hiding with his hands over his mouth. I sat for a minute when I see him running through the skate park looking for me. He slowed down near the exit which led to a long path and he literally stood there for a minute sniffing the air. No joke, he was actually sniffing the air. His hair wasn't in a ponytail anymore, it was all over. He wasn't wearing a coat, he wore a long sleeve shirt, all black. It was winter which confused me since it was so cold. He looked around and I felt his eyes scan me. Then he kept looking confused and started walking down this long path. After about ten minutes, I felt it was safe and ran back towards the park and ran into the park and ran to the gate that I usually go through to get home. It was still locked, so I climbed over it. I walked towards the school, following the path I always used and had a strange urge to look back and there, at the gate, the man was standing, standing watching me, and he laughed and said, I'll catch you one day, baby girl. Mark my words. And he blew me a kiss and walked away into the darkness. I have never been so scared in my life. I booked it home and told my mom what had happened. She called the police and the council and asked why the fence was locked. The council was just as confused as I had been because 
They had never locked the gate, ever. The police couldn't do much. They poured a warning out and that was about it. The creepy thing was that he had to have learned my pattern. He had to have known that I used the park every night to get home. It creeps me out to this day knowing I was being watched and could have been assaulted or worse. I still have nightmares from time to time about him and wonder what would have happened to me had I not gotten away or had he seen me in the bushes. I quit working at that pub and haven't used the park since. This happened to me when I was 17 years old. I'm a female. It was a warm summer night. Me, my sister, and my two cousins were sitting on a balcony that was covered with glass all over, but you can open up the windows and let some air in. I live in a small villa, so to enter the balcony, you have to open a small gate which leads to a small garden, then there is a glass door which leads to the glass balcony. We usually always left the outdoor gate open since we live in a safe neighborhood. We're hanging out there at about 3 a.m., having some food and chatting. My cousin asked me to go get some charcoal from the kitchen since we had a hookah on. Hookah and shishas are common in our culture. The charcoal I got wasn't well lit, so I decided to go outside to air it out and make it light up more. I was wearing mini shorts and a shirt. I went to the garden I was lighting the charcoal up. My dad was to the trees and bushes behind me and I was looking at a garage. As soon as I got out, I had this uneasy feeling that someone was watching me. I looked right and left, but there was no one there. So I brushed it off since I thought I was just being paranoid because it was really late at night and the neighborhood was too quiet. I got back into the house and into the balcony and my sister was on her phone. She lifted her head up and her face went completely pale. She suddenly started screaming. Who are you? What are you doing here? I was shocked. My cousin started screaming. I looked to my left, looking at the window, and I saw a tall, heavy man running out of the front gate. Moments later, we heard our neighbor scream, and turns out she was sitting on her front porch and she saw a man running and some girls screaming, so she was pretty freaked out by that. Our neighborhood and brother and dad were awoken by our screams and the police were called. My brother went running into the street looking for him, but he wasn't found. When the police arrived, they patrolled around our neighborhood, but they didn't find him. My sister was called out to the police station to describe what he looked like since she was the only one who saw him clearly at first. He had his head peeking at us creepily as we sat down from the corner of the glass window. The police cars advised my parents not to let me walk alone in the neighborhood since they were afraid that he would kidnap me or worse. This is because we live in an Islamic culture where no one is allowed to wear such revealing clothes in public. And a couple of days later, my mom was driving around the neighborhood and she found a man with the same characteristics that my sister described. He was working on the garden of our neighbors two blocks ahead of us. My sister was too scared to identify him, so he was not captured. I just can't help but think that if he grabbed me when he was right behind me and I was oblivious to what was going on, God knows what his intentions were. This happened to my family in 2005. I was a kid at the time and me and my older sister are my dad's second set of kids from his second marriage. My dad had just returned from Iraq. He was in the army but... He was just medically separated from the army after 17 years due to PTSD after a particularly horrific shelling on the base that he was stationed at at the time. When he came home, he was sick with chest congestion and a cough that sounded like a death rattle. After a week home and a round of antibiotics, his chest x-ray said that he had double pneumonia. He was admitted to the hospital and things went south quickly. He was transferred to the ICU and put on a breathing machine. My mother was a crying mess, so me and my sister knew things were not good with my dad. Later we were told the doctors had told her my dad may not make it and to make funeral arrangements. After not being able to find the correct antibiotic to cure the infection in his chest, 
My dad had to be revived several times after his heart gave in from the lack of oxygen. Luckily, a new pulmonologist was consulted and took samples of the infection and grew them in a lab and then killed the infection with the older, singular spectrum antibiotic. As soon as the medicine was given to my dad, he was quickly recovered and was home before we knew it. This is where the story really begins. After coming home from the hospital, my dad began telling stories about his brush with death. He told us that when he died, he saw his first wife, who had died years earlier, and she wouldn't let him pass her to go into the light. She just held her hands up like, stop, you can't come in. He also told us he could see the light in the corner of the ICU room. His uncles and grandparents were there. It was all very fascinating, but the stories of dead relatives were nothing compared to what happened next. When we were kids, my dad would load us up in the jeep when he was on leave and we would hit the road to Telluride or some other mountain destination to go fishing. My dad lives to go fishing and we'd love to go. He would sit on the bank of some mountain lake and my dad would bait our hooks and toss the line out and set the line. My dad and I would soon start a competition who would catch the biggest rainbow trout, who would catch more fish and... My dad would settle into his lawn chair with his fishing pole in one hand, a line in the water, and a cold beer in the other hand. My mom would make cold meat sandwiches for lunch. We would watch eagles hunting or fishing and dive down to pull fish from the water and fly away. And life was good. After my dad was fully recovered from pneumonia, he packed up the sheep one day and announced that we were going up north to tell you ride to go fishing. The Blues Festival was on, and as well, we loved going to the festival, so we happily piled into the jeep. It was a nine-hour jeep ride on a winding road, but my sister and I were excited to go. As the day got late and my sister and I were dozing in the back seat, only a few miles from our favorite camping spot, we were on one of those winding back roads when my dad suddenly stopped the jeep. His knuckles were white on the steering wheel. I was seated behind my mom, so I woke up and I saw the look on my dad's face. He looked like he had seen a ghost. The color was gone from his face. My mom asked him, Are you okay? Why are you stopping? My dad looked over at my mom and says, still looking forward, Do you see that? My mom said, See what? What my dad said next sent chills down my eight-year-old body. He said in a shaky voice, I saw a Native American in full war paint and headdress riding on a pony, keeping pace with us on the side of the road. He ran past us and cut us off. The rider and horse stopped, and they're standing in the middle of the road in front of the jeep. Can you see them? The silence in the jeep was deafening. My dad was shaking, staring straight ahead. The sweat was beaded up on his forehead. My mom finally broke the silence. I can't see him. Asking again, Are you okay? I couldn't see it either, and I said so, but I could tell my dad could see him. And suddenly my dad jumped like someone had snapped their fingers in front of his face and said loudly, Oh my god, he's gone. He just faded away. To understand how weird this was, you have to know how no-nonsense my dad is. He's not one for fantasy. He's always been skeptical of the paranormal and would make fun of my mom for watching ghost shows. He sat there for a few minutes. My dad was obviously trying to pull himself together. He ran his shaking hands through his grown-out buzz cut, and he shook his hands like they hurt from gripping the steering wheel so hard. The rest of the fishing trip and festival went normally, but I could tell my dad was shook. He was very quiet and looked like he was often deep in thought. We had been home for about a week in Colorado when one Saturday morning I could hear my dad talking in my parents' bedroom excitedly. I could hear him telling my mom that he had seen a little girl and a big white dog walk through their bedroom. The girl was dressed in a white period gown and had a red ribbon in her short brown hair. 
She had stopped in front of my dad, who was sitting on the edge of his bed. She looked up at him. Her dog sat down next to her. After a minute, she turned in her heel and her dog followed her out of the bedroom and through the wall. At this point, my dad was probably doubting his sanity. He had been looking for a federal job and soon he was gone again, finding a job that took him to D.C. several months a year. He never brought up his paranormal experiences again. However, he never made fun of my mom's ghost TV shows again. My father killed my mother when we were very young. My mother was a drug addict and my father caught her selling herself. He served seven years for manslaughter and I never blamed him. My mother was a horrible person. My sister and I were raised by my grandmothers. She was a strict Catholic and made us go to church and learn about the spirit world. She was very sweet to us and let me tell you, her cooking was crazy good. We grew up in the kitchen laughing and having a wonderful time listening to her stories and laughing at her jokes. My grandmother was funny and she was smart. She taught us all the things we needed to to survive not only in the kitchen but in the streets too. Never show anyone you have money. And we laughed because we never had money. La abuelita, my sister's elbows me and whispers, Nana. I whisper back, stop whispering. No one can hear you stupid, we laughed. Our Nana was funny like that, always saying things that were silly and strange and weird, and she liked to play on her, as my sister says, Ouija board. We scoffed, but stayed away about the same. Some say it was a sin, but I really didn't care either way. Football was more important. My sister is laughing, then she whispers feverishly to me. Stop it, I say, I'm getting to that part. So one day, Nana says we must go to the market and stand and wait. Will said, wait for what, Nana? Nana says, we wait for the perfect time. So, we wait. Some people bought rice and some people bought alcohol and beer. Some people bought lottery tickets and some people bought Marlboro because it's cheap here and we got bored. Then all of a sudden, my grandma looked all pale and sweaty and I got very scared for her. Then she says, wow. Go get the lottery. The Loteria Nacional para la Asistencia Pública is the Mexican lottery and lots of people play it. She pushed a sweaty dollar into my hand and as I was buying the ticket, all the hair on my arms stood up straight. Both my sister and I were a little scared for Nana because she looked like she might faint. So we made her sit down for some time before we walked back home. That night we listened on the neighbor's radio when the lottery was drawn. Grandmother said to us, both in a quiet whisper, When we win, do not shout, do not be excited, make no sound, my dears. We looked at each other like Nana had lost her mind. I asked my sister, Oh, that's right, her marbles. When the numbers came out, our Nana took us by the hands, said thank you to our neighbor and walked us home. She looked very sad and so were we sad too. But I never thought that we would win at all, so I don't understand why she was squeezing my hand so very hard. We get inside our thin walled house and Nana puts her finger to her lips and then says, When I tell you something so secret, you cannot make a sound. You can jump up and down and smile as wide as you please, but please don't make a single sound. We look at each other. Alright, crazy lady. She then got stern and said in a sharp whisper, Promise me. We both said that we promised simultaneously. Yes, yes, of course. When Nana talked like this, we listened. If you know anything about Mexican grandmothers, you shut up and listen when they say shut up. My grandmother is nodding her head, eyes wide. Nana said to me, Go get me the ticket. I ran to get the ticket, thinking she was going to make a joke, and handed it to me. She said, Read to me the numbers. We read the numbers, and after we did, she gave us the tickets, and we checked the numbers, and then checked them again. My sister's eyes grew very wide, but I was confused. What was going on? All the hair stood up on my arms and my legs, and my sister and I nearly fainted when my dear Nana 
Our loving and kind-hearted sweet grandmother said the two words I shall forever hear in my mind, in my dreams. We won. We all stood there gasping, in each other's arms in shock. Nana said, Your hairs are standing up. And I nodded. Yes, Nana, they were. And we all started wildly jumping up and down and up and down and round and round. And I didn't know Grandma could jump so high. We silently screamed and jumped and then twirled around, swinging our arms. I feverishly whispered, How much? How much? Nana stopped jumping and looked up, doing a quick calculation. 120,601 pesos. And we all fell to the floor. Actually fell down to the floor. The silence was deafening. I remember the silence being so loud it was staggering. Nana gathered us together and we sat cross-legged facing each other like conspirators. The smile on my face was beginning to hurt, so I whispered, How much is that in American dollars? Everyone knew American dollars were king, and my sister, who was smarter than me at math, said, Five thousand American dollars. Ay caramba! I could not believe our luck. My nana said to us, Now listen, Ninos, because this is not a game. We must be very careful. We must be very secretive. We must not change a thing. But with careful planning, we can have a better life. Why did our grandma seem like she had been planning for this for a long time? How did she know when to play the lottery? She continued, Tomorrow we'll go to church like normal. On a Monday, we will get our winnings and go to the bank. At the bank, we'll deposit our money. Comprehende? Yes, yes, we nodded. You must tell no one. This is very important. No one must know that we have this good fortune. Good fortune? This was a miracle. When I think about it now, as a grown adult, it makes sense, but as a boy, I knew nothing but poverty. And the same thing every day, and I knew no different. So for years, things went on as usual, and we grew up pretty much the same. Sometimes we noticed more food, and on special occasions some sweets, and maybe some new shirt or two, but besides that, we kept our promises, and we kept our mouths shut. On my 18th birthday, Nana gave me the bank book and some other papers. She told me that I was the man of the house now, and that I was wise enough to have the full responsibility for the family, as she was getting on in years. She said that there was an apartment that we would rent not too far from where we grew up, and so we moved into that place. It was honestly a mansion to us. Running water, showers that were hot. It was magical. Nana said to me, It is paid for a year, and after a year, I made plans for you to go visit America. My eyes wide with shock. I started to speak, but she put her finger to her lips and whispered, Don't tell a soul but you will know the right time to take everything and go to America. So I said not a word to anyone until now, of course. We stayed in that apartment for a year, but before that year was over, Grandmother passed away. The church we attended took care of the necessary arrangements as she was well-loved and gave generously to the parish. That day was a very sad day for my sister and I, and we adored our sweet Nana like no one can really understand. All the things and experiences we had gone through over the years had bonded us like no human beings have ever been bonded. That was the time of tears, as my sister calls it. She weeps right now as I type this on my Mac Pro. Oh yes, we are living in America now. I cannot tell you where, but I can tell you it's warm and dry and very nice. I even have a car to drive, if you can believe that. I'm sure you're wondering how we got here, and my sister is giving me that anxious look that says, Get on with it already, bro. Okay? Okay. It's been ten years since our grandmother's passing, and when we left Mexico, all we had was the bank book, some papers, and Nana's Ouija board. My sister took care of it, as it was the very bank book that I took care of. Yes, Nana gave my little sister that weird box of the spirit world when she gave me the responsibility of our finances. Anytime we were troubled or didn't know what to do, we would go and have a chat with Nana and the Ouija board, or so she says. It was a bunch of superstitious nonsense to me, but I have to respect her and didn't stick my nose into anything she did. 
When we were hassled by the cartel, when we got our passports and American identification during our travels, she would talk to Nana, and the trouble would just kind of go away. Poof. So sorry. So sad. New passports and IDs? When we needed to find a lawyer in America, Nana found one. Or so my sister said. I did not concern myself with her responsibility, and she did not concern herself with mine. We were a great team. Well, we go to America and meet with our lawyer, a pleasantly cheerful American whom I liked immediately. He sat us down and told us how our grandmother had invested half of our money in a company called Amazon, and that we had earned quite a sum of money for this small investment. Nothing outlandish, but to us, 150,000 US dollars was a fortune. This time we did scream, and jumped up and down and twirled and danced and yelled and laughed and so hard even the lawyer joined us. That's when I learned his fee was 25%. Then we were not so happy. I did some research and learned that we should pay the stockbroker a yearly fee to not only buy and sell stock but to also help us with things like investment and advice and rebalancing our portfolio. These full service stockbrokers usually charge between 1 and 2% of the total amount of assets they manage for you. This guy was trying to rob us. My sister did not like it at all and went to talk to Nana. The next day we were notified that our lawyer was in a car accident. He was driving down the road and crashed into a retaining wall and he died instantly. Somehow his briefcase had fallen and lodged itself between the seat and the headlight switch. The headlights turned off and we were told that he probably was struggling to loosen it when, boom, he died. Oh well. So sorry, so sad. The company he worked for had been investigating him for embezzlement and fraud and gave us back all that he had stolen. Our new lawyer is much better. Now we are not so trustworthy nor naive any longer. Right, sis? My sister nods and I see that she has a slight grin on her face which makes the hairs of my arms stand up. We bought a house and the real estate lady named Karen was a bright and overly friendly, hyper-crazy lady that made us both nervous. She was very flirtatious with me, but showed us a wonderful three-bedroom house in a very nice neighborhood. She said that her 12% fee was far below market value. I thought that was a great price, but before we signed, my sister said that she would like to ask our Nana if this was the right house for us. I did some research and found that the typical commission is 6%, which is split by the agent for the buyer and the agent for a seller, 3% each, paid only by the seller, not us. My sister had a very stern look on her face as she gathered the Ouija board and went to her room. The next morning, I was making some huevos rancheros, just laughing and joking with my sister as we usually did, when I got a phone call. It was the real estate company letting us know that they'll be assigning us a new real estate agent to us. I had mentioned that we were signing today and they said the new papers would have to be drawn as they found a discrepancy in our contract. I asked him what had become of that obnoxious woman. My sister elbowed me and said shush, I am an other agent. She seems that she was at an open house and was laughing so hard she swallowed a jumbo shrimp and it lodged in her throat and she died. Oh well, so sorry, so sad. That is just terrible, huh sis? Seems she had been overcharging people for years and they would not have ever found out until they looked over my paperwork after her accident. Just now there is a knock at the door. I'll be right back. Well, it was an immigration officer asking to see our passports... I showed him our D's and he examined them. My sister said, I'm going to go talk to Nana. The immigration officer nodded, looked up and motioning to my arm said, The hairs on my arms just stood right up. I looked down. So they did. So they did. So sorry. So sad. I have read countless stories about other people's experiences with sleep paralysis and I thought I would share my scariest ones. Everyone has heard of the shadow people. I've had an unknown black force pin me down in my bed, suffocating me. However, the other two instances I've had are more bizarre and I still think about it quite often. About four years ago, I was 24 years old and I still live with my mom since I was in my second year of nursing school 
It was just easier to live at home while going to school. For context, I'm female. Going to bed one night all seemed well until I woke up for no reason. I couldn't move or talk. I heard almost static mumbling sounds on my left. Scared out of my mind, I listen as I try to desperately move. Slowly, the static starts to get clear and I hear young voices. Children's voices. They begin chanting, You're going to die. And giggling after each chant. It was like they were singing a nursery rhyme to me. They chanted the same thing over and over again, and my heart was pounding on my chest. Logically in my head, I was telling myself that this was not real. For all those that aren't religious, this may not seem like it makes much sense, but I decided to pray to God in my head to make it stop. It was like I was screaming it in my head because I couldn't physically speak. It felt like an eternity before it went away and I was able to move. I was so scared that I couldn't even move though I was physically able to. I rushed out of my room to my mom and told her everything. I didn't go back into my room that night. She looked at me in disbelief. I don't know if she truly believed me or understands sleep paralysis. And regardless, it's something I'll never forget. My second story was around the same year when sleep paralysis became a reoccurring theme every night or every other night. I just started to sleep with the lights on. For added comfort, my cats would sleep on my bed and cuddle with me until I fell asleep. For a while, no instances of sleep paralysis occurred, so I just assumed that this was what I needed to do each night. Like usual, I went to bed with the lights on and one of my cats, Salem, curled up in my arm while I slept. I woke up with a feeling of an all-too-familiar feeling of dread. I couldn't believe what was happening. I feel like I was being watched. To my horror, I can't make this stuff up if I wanted to. I disturbingly saw a white figure on the right side of my bed standing very close to me. My heart felt like it wanted to drop to my stomach. I see piercing, bright blue eyes staring back at me. As I stared more... This white figure looked like it was a member of the clan, with a white cloak and the only thing I was able to see was its eyes. As I was staring at its figure in my lightened up room, I was able to glance down at my cat, seemingly unaware of the figure and sleeping soundly. This eased me up a bit. Seeing this made me remind myself that this was not real, and after a few moments, thankfully, the figure disappeared. I work at a grocery store about five minutes away from my house as a cashier. It's a big chain of stores throughout the Midwest, but I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say what company it is. Regardless, I'm 17 and female and have worked there for the better part of seven months. That may not seem like an insanely large amount of time, but considering most new people who come in end up quitting about two weeks into the job, it feels like an eternity since I started. This isn't a long story, but it It's one that I think about a lot. Sure, I get my fair amount of old weirdos that try to flirt with me when they come through the line, or guys that try to hit on me with the most basic pickup lines. People are rude and cuss me out when I can't give them a discount that they want, or when they think I rank something up wrong. But this story isn't about those rude or gross people. It's about someone else, or something else. My boyfriend and I love talking about paranormal things. He only believes in demons, he thinks ghosts are a hoax and if there's something supernatural happening it's responsibility of a demon. I however believe that ghosts and demons both exist and are very different. One day we were sharing stories and he told me about how one time he thought that he saw someone who was in fact possessed. He used to work at a gas station and I guess one time he had this customer that really freaked him out. I don't remember the specific details, but I do remember him telling me about this one man's bright blue eyes, just absolutely piercing, and made him super uneasy. So going back to my place of work at the grocery store, one day I'm in the middle of one of my shifts. It was just a normal day, and I couldn't wait to go on my break. I was on a register, and one of my coworkers, Jimmy, was bagging for me. Well, I was distracted, probably cleaning or with a customer, when Jimmy starts freaking out. 
just like all of a sudden he lost his mind. I look over at him and I'm kind of like, what? He starts asking me, did you see that guy that just came in? He was crazy. Did you see him? I had no idea what he was talking about, as I hadn't seen anyone walk into the store. Now, Jimmy is kind of the village idiot when it comes to our place of work. He's not really smart. He's worked there for about five years and never been promoted and he's just generally lazy. He's funny, don't get me wrong, we all love him, but when it comes to him telling stories, none of us are really amused anymore. He kept going. Tell me this man came in who looked crazy. He said he looked like someone out of the Men in Black movies. It later came to my attention that Jimmy had never even seen Men in Black, but for the time being I was just kind of picturing someone wearing a tuxedo in the store. Finally, one of my managers told me it was time for me to go on break, and I guess it had been maybe five minutes since the alleged man in black came into the store and Jimmy had his little freak out. I clock out and hastily make my way to the break room, knowing every minute counts until I have to be back on the clock. My mind, distracted with thoughts of what food I was going to eat and getting to text my boyfriend back, I turned a sharp corner in the store on my way to the back. I wasn't paying attention and was going as fast as my legs could carry me. What happened next only played out in a short span of about 15 seconds, but when I think back on it, it feels like it could be hours. I turned the sharp corner and all of a sudden something was towering over me. Now I'm 5'4", which isn't extremely short for a girl my age, but whoever this was had multiple feet on me. I looked up just for a second to see who I almost ran into and my bones went cold. I instantly knew that this had to be the man Jimmy was talking about. I made a mental note to correct him. This man looked nothing like the men in black, but more like Neo from the Matrix. He was going into the building and looks up at all the people. He couldn't have been shorter than seven feet tall and had this pale, pale skin, like white, almost like a ghost. He had a long black trench coat on, one that dragged on the floor with every step he took. I don't know where he found a coat that long to match the length of his body, but sure enough, his coat was taller than he was. To match, he had long, long jet black hair that went easily down to the middle of his back, but what scared me the most about this man, this thing, was his eyes. Pure blue. Not just blue, but piercing, stunning blue, like something I had never seen before. It immediately made me feel uneasy. Now, since this had happened so fast, when I turned the corner and bumped into him, I had merely given him a glance and just kept walking. But taking a few steps back and processing what I just saw, I turned around to get another look at him. I turned around, expecting him to have kept walking the other way and about to round the corner going the direction I came from. But when I turned to take a second glance at this scary man, he had stopped dead in his tracks and turned too, and was staring at me. Like he knew I was going to look at him again. If I didn't feel numb before that, I didn't know how to feel. I've never felt pure terror go through my blood like that. I've never felt pure evil as I looked into someone's eyes before. But this man, who I don't think was a man at all, sure made me feel those things. I felt extremely uneasy and unsafe and I booked it as fast as I could to the break room to text my boyfriend about what happened. It's been months since this happened but I still can't get that image out of my head. For a long time after this incident if I closed my eyes all I could see were two bright blue eyes burning back at me. I don't know who this man was and I hope I never see him again. He's not a regular at the store and I don't know what he was doing that day I saw him. But a part of me thinks it's better I don't know, and I intend to keep it that way. For some context, I'm currently a 17-year-old female. My family is about to leave for vacation, which is why this topic has been on my mind recently. Ever since I can remember, my family had made the longish haul of a seven hour drive to stay with my grandparents in North Carolina twice a year. One week for the 4th of July in the summer and one week for Thanksgiving in the winter. 
Now, this is the house that my dad grew up in and lived in as a kid, so it's been around for a while. The way it works is my family of six sleeps amongst the upstairs since there's two bedrooms. A smaller one that used to be my aunt's and a slightly bigger one that used to be my dad's. When I was younger, I never really noticed anything strange. I guess I didn't really have a feel for the paranormal or something notable had ever happened to me that stuff just wasn't on my radar. But there was one incident that left everyone in my family speechless and we all squirm a little when we realize that we have to go back and sleep there for vacation. I couldn't have been older than six or seven at the time, so my three brothers and I, who all are close in age, were still fairly young. This particular trip to my grandparents, my mom had decided to sleep alone in the smaller bedroom. The bed in there was only uh, full-sized, and my dad being six foot two and close to 300 pounds, well... They very well couldn't share a bed. My brothers and I were all in the sleeping bags on the floor of the bigger bedroom, the one that my dad was in while he was sleeping on the bed. According to my mom's testimony, it was around 12.30am when she heard someone get up and use the bathroom. She could tell it was one of us kids based on the lightness of the footsteps. She listened to make sure whoever it was wasn't getting sick because we were traveling back home the next morning and... That just is how things go sometimes. She lay in bed listening and listening, but she never heard the mysterious person return back from the bathroom. She brushed it off, thinking maybe she drifted off and maybe whoever it was going back to the bedroom and went back to sleep for the night. The next morning we were in the car starting our long descent home. All of the kids were asleep, so my dad turned to my mom and said, The strangest thing happened last night at around 12.30 a.m., my mom, intrigued, asked what had happened. My dad proceeded to tell her that at around 12.30, he saw one of us kids get up and leave the room to go to the bathroom. My mom interjected and confessed that she had heard whoever it was, but she had never heard them return to the bedroom. My dad continued saying that he was staying awake listening too to make sure one of us kids wasn't sick. He also waited and waited checking the clock every couple of minutes to know he didn't drift out to sleep. I guess around ten minutes passed, and he finally decided to get up and go look for whoever was in the bathroom to make sure that they were okay. But as he got up out of bed and looked on the ground where us kids were asleep, he quickly and fearfully realized that all four kids were laying there, completely sound asleep. Of course, my parents didn't tell us this for years, not until we were older and had come to them, telling them of spooky things that have happened to us in that house. Every time we go, something strange always seems to happen. The most common thing is waking up in the morning to the bathroom light on when everyone swears that they turned it off. We've also heard something whispering our names, and my mother swears that she hears something breathing in the room with her. She even holds her breath to make sure it's not her own breathing. But nothing compares to that experience. And I'm sure this time around on vacation, I'll have a new experience to add to this list of scary and unexplained things that have happened in that house. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, or Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video and join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, never trust a fart. Bridget Jones with the two says, it, the 18 people dislike this, y'all mama's a bleep. <laughs> true, true. Thank you, Bridget. <laughs>